Good afternoon. Welcome to Optimal Care Pediatrics. This is our first Facebook Live event. Welcome. I'm Dr. Mondesi, a general pediatrician, and this is Ashley Calderon, a lactation consultant at Martin North. Hello. So we had wonderful feedback and a really fabulous response from all of you. Thank you so much for all these great questions. We're going to be discussing breastfeeding, myths versus facts, and we're going to just jump right in, sort of question and answer style. And you can feel free to post questions as we go along. We're going to get to as many of them as we can. And then we'll give you some instruction at the end um, in case we did not answer your question. All right. Okay. So first question, uh, can you breastfeed after a breast reduction or with breast implants? Okay, so this is um, a very common question that we encounter. And the way that I answer that is, um, Unfortunately, we really won't know the extent um, until once the baby is born. And I'll tell you why. If we've had a breast reduction, then um, there's a good chance that milk ducts have been removed. So there's going to be a higher risk for not being able to, um, to produce a, a sufficient supply. But any breast milk is better than no breast milk. With breast implants, it's going to... Um, to make a little bit of a difference depending on a couple of things. It, it, we, while we did not have the milk ducts removed the way that we would if we had um, a reduction with the implants, we don't know if the ducts have been severed and if mom has any sensation in her nipple still. So if mom does not have sensation, that could potentially affect the hormones being released and again could reduce supply. Um, so early skin to skin, feeding early and often, um, and talking with a lactation consultant is going to help get off to the best start and ensure making as much milk as that mom possibly can. Excellent. And how can mom maintain her milk supply when returning to work? So working moms is a big deal. Um, when we're returning to work, um, we want to have a really good plan in place. I think it's really important to talk to your caregiver who's going to be taking care of your child and get on the same page while also talking to your employer and having a plan. Mm -hmm. So first of all, mommy should know that legally, they do have the right to have unpaid break time to express milk for their child. And how many times you need personally to pump um, is a good conversation to have with your employer prior to going back. So some strategies we can use, um, you should also know that you can contact your insurance company to obtain a double electric pump for no charge, or there may be little charge, but there really should be no charge at all for that. Double electric pump is always gonna be the best bet, meaning that you can plug it into the wall and pump both breasts at the same time. Um, it can be hard when you're hooked up to a machine as opposed to having a nice baby with you. So using guided imagery, meaning um, trying to relax so that your milk can let down, thinking about water flowing, having pictures of the baby, something that smells like the baby, and getting comfortable using your hands on your breasts. So um, using hand expression, either solely being reliant on hand expression or using your hands to massage to get the milk to begin to let down, and using your hands to massage during the pumping process is going to really help to drain um, thoroughly all of the milk ducts around the breast. Excellent. And how can mom increase her supply once the baby gets older and demands more milk? So um, in this question, the mom's only able to pump twice um, so, at work. Sure. I think that that, um, I really think that the answer to the first question that we just were talking about can also address this situation, whereas it, it's hard to put a quantity on breast milk because it changes so much throughout the day. So looking at five ounces, you know, in the morning versus five ounces in the evening, it's kind of just an arbitrary label um, because the composition is so different. So uh, do we really need to increase the volume that much? It's going to be a really specific situation. Um, so in order to really just get the most out of what your storage capacity is, I think using those strategies already talked about are going to be your best bet. Now, if you're having a significant decrease in supply and you're really concerned about that, then I think reaching out to a lactation consultant for a private consult or to your pediatrician if you're concerned would probably be your best bet. Okay. 
And how can nipple confusion be avoided and what types of nipples and bottles are most similar to the breast? I love this question. <laughs> I love this question because I love to talk about nipple confusion. Um, so to address how can it be avoided, if we can avoid um, any types of artificial nipples or pacifiers until your baby is an expert at breastfeeding. So for the first probably four to six weeks, um, that's the best way to avoid nipple confusion. Now, when we're talking about what is nipple confusion, is it real? You know, some babies have one artificial nipple and they have a really difficult time going back to the breast. Some babies do both breast and bottle and they do fine with it. I don't really think it's nipple confusion as much as it is either um, a difference in the flow that they're getting from um, the bottle with an artificial nipple as opposed to the breast. Um, or it's just changing their expectation for the way that they're sucking. And what I mean by that is if you think about breastfeeding, we, we're, we're breastfeeding, right? So we need a nice mouthful of breast tissue um, to latch onto. If a baby has a, a artificial nipple from a bottle, they're very passive, right? It, it kind of just flows into their mouth um, and they're not having to work for it. Same thing with a pacifier right? They're, they're just kind of non-nutritively sucking. And because they're so little, they suck, suck, suck. They still are releasing um, enzymes that they would be to digest food, even though they didn't get anything. So they think that they're full when they didn't actually get anything from a pacifier. Um, then they return to breast and they think that, well, I got that really great full feeling. I can just do this again at the breast. So it changes that expectation rather than actively needing them to open wide to latch on. So I don't know if it's nipple confusion or just they get a little lazy. Right. <laughs> it changes that. Um, and then one of the other things we could talk about with that is if you are having to give um, supplements either of express breast milk or formula to your baby is using something called paste bottle feeding. Tell um, us about that. That's I will, yeah. So. First of all, with the paste bottle feeding, I always recommend for newborns using a slow flow nipple instead of a um, regular flow nipple. And that's regardless of whether they're being breastfed or formula fed, because the baby then has a slower flow um, entering their mouth and they have a chance to feel full. And they're still working a little bit longer at that. Um, as opposed to regular flow, if they're laid back and it's just coming in their mouth, they're gonna swallow a lot um, so that they don't drown. <laughs> okay. And um, they might overfeed because they didn't have time to feel full. So that's part one. Um, in addition, when we're talking about paste bottle feeding, we want to have the baby held more upright, not laying back. The bottle should be pretty horizontal. So we want to make sure either formula or express breast milk is filling the nipple completely so that they're not sucking air. Yeah. But it allows us to um, to feed the baby slower and the baby is still actively involved in that process and then we can stop them, slow them down, burp them and then give it again. So it's paced. It's not just rushing into their mouth. So there's less chance of them overfeeding. Okay. And do you have a favorite nipple or bottle? I get that question a lot. I don't. I don't. You know, every baby's different. I think there's a lot of marketing out there. Yes. There's a lot yes. of um, different options and I hear most moms say that the least expensive one was their favorite one. So um, I trial think that it is, it's trial and error. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, can you comment on supplements that can increase milk supply like fenugreek or breastfeeding teas and breastfeeding cookies? Right. Um, if you like them, go for it. Um, there's not really any true evidence out there. We haven't had a lot of research that um, it actually increases milk supply. Um, the best thing to do is to get the baby to breast as much as possible because what we know 100% increases supply is um, is supply and demand. So the more we're stimulating the breast, the more milk we're going to make. Excellent. Okay. And can you give a recommendation for the best breast pump for a working mom? The best breast pump for a working mom is probably going to be um, a double electric breast pump. Right. So again, um, some of the really popular brands are Medela. Amita. Um, I've heard a lot of moms really happy with Spectras right now. Um, so again, contacting your insurance company and knowing what um, providers they, they are um, contracted with 
and what's available to you for, for no fee. Does WIC offer a breast pump as well? Yes. So there are ways of that. And um, if a mom is on Medicaid, Medicaid often requires that the baby has been born before they will give it. So talking with your OB about um, having a prescription for that, or if they let the lactation consultant and the hospital know that they are interested, then sometimes we can get the paperwork faxed over a little bit faster to try to expedite that process. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And, oh, this was a good one. What type of bra is best to use while nursing? And any recommendations on a sports bra for moms going back to the gym? Um, right, so with regards to bras, we want to avoid underwire. Um, we want our bras to be supportive, but not restrictive. Because if we have anything that's uh, kind of digging into um, the breast tissue, it's going to hinder the way the milk is flowing. That's where we lead to plug ducts, which could lead to the dreaded mastitis <laughs> um, and infection. So um, again, support is wonderful. It's summer. It is about 110 degrees outside. It's humid, right? We're in Florida right now. Um, so I would also suggest that anytime you're outside and you've been, you know, sweating, um, to come inside and change that as, as soon as you possibly can. Okay. Um, having really good hygiene with that so that if there was any breakdown in your nipple, you just don't want bacteria to have a chance to enter in. So changing often okay. um, is a good thing. But cotton bras, no wonder why are okay. supportive, just not restrictive. And that's the same for the sports bras? Yeah, yeah. it's the same thing. Okay. Oh, I get this question a lot too. Will squirting breast milk into the baby's eye cure an eye infection? <laughs> well, I guess that depends on what the infection is, right? I love breast milk. I think it's a wonderful thing um, as much as anybody else possibly could. If it's something simple like a, a plug duct, um, tear duct, then it, it potentially would be helpful. It's not going to hurt anything, but I would refer you back to your pediatrician for further okay. evaluation. Yes, because there are several causes of eye infection. So we want to figure out, is it a true eye infection, a block duct, and, and then kind of advise you from there. Absolutely. And when should a mom stop breastfeeding? Gosh, that's such an individualized question. Um, I can talk about what the recommendations are um, for, for our country in the United States. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends exclusive breast milk feeding for the first six months of life. So does your baby need any uh, rice cereal or water um, or anything, any other supplements for the first six months? If you have a healthy, well, newborn um, that's been a term baby and no other complications, then the answer is no, just breast milk for six months. Around six months, you can begin introducing uh, complementary solid foods. And again, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends continuing that for the first year of life and then as mutually beneficial for mom and baby. Um, the World Health Organization says until two or three years old at a minimum. So it's very cultural yes. what is accepted. Um, but as long as you and your baby and your family are happy, then keep going, mama. <laughs> agree, agree. And then what is the best way to wean a baby when mom is ready to wean? Sure, sure. So I think cutting back um, one feeding at a time, right? Um, what I hear the most is that the last feeding typically will be either when, um, when mom comes home from work and they're just looking for that snuggle time or that's how they've been getting them to sleep. So it's that last one before bed is the last to go. So just cutting out one at a time, um, trying to distract, coming up with new routines, maybe some, you know, baby massages, um, uh, and maybe reading to them, just coming up with a different routine, trying to distract, um, offering them maybe a new, a new sippy cup, um, a new straw, something to take that place, um, and being patient. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And can mom continue to breastfeed once the baby gets teeth? Absolutely, absolutely. I know it's scary. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to put my breast into <laughs> this little piranha's <laughs> mouth. Um, and with that, it, if they're biting, then they're not nursing because yeah. they have to have their lips, you know, flared out, a nice suction. Um, those cute baby cheeks are what helps to, to seal that suction. Um, so if they're biting, they're not feeding anyway. So if they bite, um, and you react to that, just stop it. Just write it. Okay, then this nursing session is over. Take it away from them. Um, because sometimes they find it, they think it's a game. And if mommy reacts to it, oh, and it's a big reaction, um, they might think that's funny. 
and then they're going to keep doing it to see yeah. what did you do next so after that initial shock uh, if you can try not to react and just cut off that session um that's going to be the, the the best first advice that i have at least <laughs> and they always just say stop biting no biting right and they'll, they'll pick up on those cues yes especially if you take away what they want <laughs> um and oh this came in um recently uh, is it safe to purchase breast milk online? So some moms, their supply is dwindling or they're worried about the supply and they want to continue breastfeeding, so they <coughs> seek to purchase breast milk. Can you advise us on that? Yes, and I, I would highly um, discourage someone from doing that. Um, quite frankly, you know, when we're purchasing something online, not only do we not know maybe the person um, who's uh, selling it, what their um, health status is. We don't even really know if it's breast milk. Correct. We don't know what it might be. Um, and even if it is breast milk and it's someone who, uh, you know, is, is very healthy, we don't know what their storage guidelines were like. How long, when was it really expressed? Um, was it refrigerated? Was it frozen? How is it being shipped to you? Anytime that something's being sold um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, especially breast milk for a price, that's a red flag. Um, we do use human um, donor milk in lots of hospitals around the country. It's gone through an extensive screening process, just like blood products would. Um, and typically that's going to be for our babies that are um, in the NICU that have some kind of compromised health status or separated from their mother. Um, so uh, buying breast milk on the, on the internet is probably, probably not the safest um, option. And we, Think about it as a live product, so absolutely it's a living product. So you certainly don't want to take certain safety precautions with it, for sure. Absolutely. And can you comment on physiologic jaundice uh, versus uh, and the levels that are a cause for concern? Yeah, yeah. So um, in in all of my prenatal breastfeeding classes that I teach, um, I always like to tell families what to expect after the baby is born. Because um, a, a big question I get is, you know, how do I know if my baby's getting enough? Um, so the, the simple question or answer to that question and why it leads to this, um, you know, comment on jaundice is because the big things, of course, we look for, is the baby satisfied? Um, is it hurting mom? Are they peeing and pooping based on the, um, the, the age that they are, based on the day of life? Um, and then a little bit more into that, what I look at as a lactation consultant well, on the inpatient side is I look at weight loss. We expect babies to lose some weight. We don't want them to lose too much weight. Um, and I look at what their um, bilirubin or their jaundice level is. So it, it varies based on the baby's age and their hours of life. And we have a chart that we look at, which tells us, um, is the baby in a high risk, in a low risk, um, or an intermediate risk zone? And would phototherapy be recommended for that? That's something that either the pediatrician or the neonatologist will recommend to that family. Um, most all babies have some level of physiologic jaundice, um, so we expect that. It's just when it gets into those higher levels um, that we do become concerned. Can you still now, breastfeed? If you please keep breastfeeding, yes. So one of those big myths out there is that it's the breast milk causing the jaundice. Um, we're not going to see that in the first couple of days of life. Absolutely not. It's going to be not enough breast milk jaundice, perhaps, meaning that we might need to evaluate how is breastfeeding going. Mm -hmm. Because if the baby's not eating enough and they're not pooping, um, then those jaundice levels are going to rise. So we need to work on breastfeeding while um, perhaps the baby is under some phototherapy. If a, if if the provider is concerned about the volume that the baby is receiving, um, they might talk about some supplementation. Now, what I always try to advocate for is we're going to supplement then with mom's express breast milk. So if it's a concern high enough that we really need more volume for the baby, I would recommend starting to pump as soon as possible um, and then giving that express breast milk so that we can still try and stay away from formula. Okay. So then what is the breast milk jaundice? Breast milk jaundice is something we'll see later on, a couple weeks um, out. And that's a very, very rare um, situation that a pediatrician would be able to identify first and then um, could consult, you know, lactation to help with that if necessary. But that's going to be a whole different conversation um, that even if that was something a family encountered, they would not know that in the first days of life. Okay. Um, and this question came in recently. Uh, my baby hasn't hasn't seemed interested in nursing. 
since he started solid foods? And how can I get my baby interested in nursing again? Or is this just part of the weaning process? And this child is 11 months old. Yeah, so actually I would say, I'm glad that your 11 month old is so interested in solid foods and in other things like playing. Um, Because developmentally, that's absolutely what we want to see, what we expect to see. Um, I would recommend if if you're wanting to continue nursing, um, you know, after the first year of life, and the baby seems like they're not as interested, um, offer the breast before offering the solid foods. Um, That might be one way. Because if they're eating lots of solid foods and they're full, then they might be more interested in, you know, going off and playing rather than nursing. Um, So offering the breast first would be um, my recommendation. And then at that point, you know, just kind of allowing them to come back because they're not going to nurse every three hours all the time once they hit 11 months old. It might only be, you know, a few times a day at that point, and that's normal. Okay. Um, For a baby that is uh, three months old and receiving, like, 50% breast milk and 50% formula, can there be a transition back to solely breast milk? What would mom have to do um, to increase her supply? Right. So since we already kind of hit on um, supplements that increase milk supply, right, not really being well studied, not having a lot of evidence, I'm probably not going to recommend going out and you know filling your cabinets with oatmeal and fenugreek and, and, and milk's mom, mom's milk tea, um, unless it's something she enjoys. But I would think that absolutely that would be a really good time to contact a lactation consultant. Um, it's, is it possible? Uh, yes. Um, I want to do in a thorough um, assessment as to, you know, why was the baby on 50-50 breast milk? I would need to evaluate the baby's um, oral cavity, their, what they're doing at the breast, um, if mom's pumping, how often she's pumping. You know, I'd want to know a little bit about mom's history, maybe her breast anatomy. So is it possible? Absolutely. I think that that warrants um, more of a private consult and a little bit more um, information there. Some of the general things we could talk about, power pumping, again, hands-on expression, just offering it a little bit more often, um, those types of things. But I think that that would deserve probably a little bit more information. All right. Uh, can circumcision interrupt breastfeeding? So if, I'm assuming that we're talking about um, kind of immediately in that newborn, newborn period, first couple of yes. days. Mm-hmm. Um, well, circumcision definitely can make babies more sleepy and it's painful. So my recommendation is to wait until closer to discharge. Um, once we've got breastfeeding a little bit more established, if we're doing it, you know, closer to 24 hours of life, we really don't know what you and your baby are capable of from a breastfeeding standpoint anyway. Then when we throw on top of it, if the baby is experiencing, you know, some tenderness in that area, um, we want babies to do lots of skin to skin. I like to put babies on, on right on mommy's belly and on her chest. Um, and if, if, our, if our little baby boy is not able to push his hips down and really extend his neck backwards, um, and he's kind of more pulling like this because he's in pain, then certainly that can affect learning how to latch in those early days. Um, so, or we might have a sleepy baby. Um, I always go back to skin to skin. That's my, my kind of reset button. Um, so do I advise having a circumcision in the hospital in the first few days? I have no issues with that. Um, that's certainly a, a personal choice. Um, just be prepared that it could um, interfere with learning a little bit how to breastfeed. So you would recommend waiting at least the 24 hours? Absolutely. I would. I would until closer to discharge. Okay. And why does my baby spit up so much through his nose and continue to nurse? I think this is also such a great question um, because we hear a lot about reflux, right? Um, Parents are always concerned about refluxing. So why does the baby spit up through their nose? Are they a happy spitter? Um, They spit up because their food is completely liquid. Um, Their lower esophageal sphincter is their tone is decreased. So if they get even a little bit of air um, in their belly and they burp, then it tends to come up with it. Some of that's going to come up through their nose. And if they're not affected by it and they continue to nurse, they're voiding and stooling, um, they're gaining weight, they don't look like they're in any pain, it's really not a concern at all. Typically, they're going to outgrow that. Okay. Excellent. And do we have any questions coming? Twins, breastfeeding twins. 
Okay. Can you comment on twins and, and nursing twins? Sure. What challenges um, would mom have? Yeah. It, it is, well, um, is there a specific question about the twins or just comment on twins? Is it possible? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Yes. So if your body was able to um, grow two babies, then your body will be able to feed two babies. Um, we can work um, with lactation on getting um, set up. A lot of moms will use a double football hold. So they'll have one baby on one breast, the other baby on the other breast, and feed at the same time. Um, and then the next time you're offering, you can switch which baby was on each breast. Um, I think for a trying to manage time. That is um, what a, a lot of moms will do. Um, if you have a baby that likes to eat at a little bit of a different time, because I, I do try and, and promote cue-based feeding instead of watching the clock. Um, so one baby might wake up and want to feed at a different time than, than their twin does, and that's okay too. Um, I think just finding your support system, finding what works for you, and um, is it possible though to feed both babies? Absolutely, yes, 100%. Okay. And um, then you said uh, feeding cues. Can you tell me more about the feeding cues versus uh, 15 minutes per breast? Right, right. Which is best? Yes. It's absolutely best to, um, to watch your baby and to look for cues. So um, what we teach is that looking for any early signs of hunger. So crying is a very late sign of hunger. And it's hard to calm a baby and teach them how to breastfeed if they're so upset um, that they're not able to, to calm themselves down, right? So we have to reorganize that behavior, I'll always offer skin to skin for that. So if we don't wait until they're crying, we wanna look for cues like smacking their lips, bringing their hands into their mouth, if they're protruding their tongue sticking out of their mouth, even if they're sleeping um, and their eyes are closed, but you see their eyes are moving underneath their eyelids, that is a great time that if they're not already in a diaper, get them right against mom's skin. So mom doesn't need a bra, doesn't need a shirt, doesn't need anything, especially in those first few days of life, um, and get baby just into a diaper and offer them the breast then because they're nice and calm and relaxed and it's a peaceful time to offer them the breast. So looking for those cues and offering the breast every time they see. Um, just to expand on that a little bit more, we recommend eight to 12 breastfeeding sessions in a 24 hour period. So babies want to cluster feed. They might have a, a span in the evening or at night um, where they want to feed every hour for four or five hours in a row, right? And then they fall asleep and they sleep for four or five hours in a row. As long as they're latching on well, they're voiding and stooling, they are having um, you know, periods of being awake and alert and they're, they're content, that's okay. So we don't need to wake them up. We don't need to limit how much time they're on the breast. Um, we really need to trust ourselves to get to know our babies and trust our babies. So how will I know if baby's full? Um, I would say to allow the baby to, um, to act, uh, stay on one breast as long as they're actively um, sucking. If they come off of the breast and they're content and they're milk drunk, their arms a little like baby barometer, they start very um, midline and their arms are very um, pulled into their body. As they get content, that arm starts to relax a little bit. So if they're falling asleep and they're relaxed, they're done. If they come off the breast and they're still actively looking like they want to eat more, mm -hmm. offer them the other breast. Um, it's kind of like dinner and dessert. So they might not fully eat from the other side, um, but typically then they're going to be content. And it might not be the same at every feeding, right? I mean, I'm hungrier sometimes during the day than at other times during the day. Um, so at some feedings, they might take both breasts and at some feedings, they might take one. So I, that's why I think that just getting to know yourself and your baby um, is so important because everybody's journey is very different. Exactly. And what goes in has to come out. So we also keep track of the stool Absolutely. and the wet diapers. And Absolutely. Know that, you know, they've got enough in. Yes. Um, and while watching their weight at the same time. Yep. <laughs> then you also mentioned sticking their tongue out. Can yes. you talk a little bit about tongue tie and what that is and how can that be a concern for breastfeeding? Yeah, absolutely. It's a very hot topic. Um, so with the tongue tie, um, meaning that the baby's tongue has some restriction, so they're not able to completely bring their tongue out of their mouth. That's important for breastfeeding for a couple of reasons. We need a baby to extend their tongue 
cup it around the breast and create a nice vacuum seal in order to maintain that latch and be able to really sufficiently be transferring milk, um, while at the same time not harming or damaging mom's nipples. Okay, so if a baby has any restrictions with their tongue, there's the potential that um, mom's gonna have a lot of pain, a lot of pain. And if they're not able to transfer enough milk, then we're gonna have you know all those red flag types of problems, right? Um, all babies have a, a frenulum. So just because we see the lingual, lingual frenulum doesn't mean that's necessarily a tie. We really need to look at the function of the tongue and how they're doing um, at the breast. So are we gonna know the extent of that function in the first 24 hours? Probably not, unless it's a very, very severe tie. Um, as a lactation consultant, I, I cannot diagnose the tongue tie, but I can um, certainly identify that there may be some restrictions and refer them out to the community to someone who would be able to further assess that and, if necessary, um, recommend having a phrenotomy or cutting the tongue tie so that the tongue can have um, be released and have more um, ability to extend out. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Thank you. And we have some more questions coming in. What are the common questions that we get um, regarding breastfeeding? <laughs> well, <laughs> most of these are, these are yeah, pretty, uh, yeah. pretty common questions that we would get. Um, a lot of them on, you know, especially when you're first starting to nurse and, and um picking up that rhythm and building the confidence and most of the questions are surrounding usually initiation. Well, I guess another um, one common question I hear a lot um, are about nipple shields. So maybe mm. we could talk a little bit about nipple shields. Sure. Um, it kind of sparked my, my thought process with talking about the tongue tie, right? So um, there are situations where a nipple shield is a wonderful thing. If a mom truly has flat or inverted nipples, mm -hmm. um, then a nipple shield can be very helpful. If a baby has a severe um, tongue restriction, then a nipple shield can be very helpful. I try not to, unless mom has extensive damage um, to her nipple, or like I said, truly inverted nipples, I try not to use them at all in the first 24 hours of life because it is still a barrier between um, the baby's mouth and the mother's breast tissue. Okay. Um, so it, it can be a risk for decreased milk production. So if we do use one in the hospital, typically I would recommend that mom begins pumping her breast a couple times a day, because um, our, our main goals are number one, we wanna feed the baby. Mm -hmm. Number two, we wanna protect the milk supply. So if we have any types of risk to how much production will be made, um, then pumping might be helpful for that. Um, and then with flat nipples, because I, I think that we watch breastfeeding videos and you know when mommies come to class, it looks like, Wow, these are perfectly erect nipples. Mine don't look like that. Um, and so again, just like with the tongue, I'm, I'm not as worried about the appearance as I am the function. Right. Um, so just because a mom has flat nipples doesn't necessarily mean we need to jump to a shield or that she won't be able to breastfeed her baby. And what do you recommend for a mom who has damaged nipples? Um, you know, baby didn't get a great latch and now mom is sore. Right. So um, that makes me think earlier about the question, can I squirt the breast milk in the baby's eye? And we're like, well, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, one thing 100% we can use breast milk for in practicing that hand expression is if we hand express either colostrum or breast milk mm -hmm. and um, just rub that onto the nipple or areola, it works as like an emollient. And all those good antibodies that go to the baby mm -hmm. will help promote um, mom's skin to heal as well. So you just rub it on, let it air dry. No need to pat it off with a towel or anything um, while we work on a deeper latch. Because once the baby is latched on really deeply and the nipple is in the back of the mouth, there will not be any additional trauma. Mom will immediately feel some relief. It might not be perfect. Um, and the skin will heal very quickly. Do you recommend lanolin cream? Lanolin is fine. It's fine. I, I recommend using your own breast milk first. Um, lanolin is, is a safe product that's out there. Um, and it says that it's safe to put the baby right to breast um, and there's no need to wipe it off. I err on the side of caution. I always recommend just wiping it off before putting the baby on, but it, that's um, absolutely a fine alternative to use. Okay. And this question just came in. Uh, can you breastfeed if you are pregnant again? Yes, you can. You can. Um, 
Some things to know, once you enter into the second trimester, you are beginning to make colostrum again. So um, your body is going to protect the younger baby. Um, so sometimes, if it's a toddler, once the, the milk changes to that colostrum, sometimes they don't like it anymore. And I, I do hear a lot of times that they'll kind of stop breastfeeding at that point, which for some families, they're relieved about that and some are sad. So it is just something to know. But if they like it and they're fine with it, then absolutely you can continue breastfeeding. And um, some families uh, choose to tandem nurse. So they will nurse their newborn baby, boys nurse the newborn first, right. um, and then the toddler will nurse afterwards, and, and that's perfectly wonderful too. Would that affect supply? Would being pregnant again affect the breast milk supply? Um, because it does convert back to colostrum for the pregnancy is what your body is going to, um, to show the primary concern for, it could affect the supply, yes. But typically that's going to be into the, the child, the older child that's still breastfeeding will be in toddlerhood. Mm -hmm. So it's less of a supply and nutritional standpoint of that. It's more of a comfort or for the long-term immunity that they're doing it for. Okay. And this mom is looking for local classes after the baby is born in. Uh, so it was a breastfeeding support class. Okay, great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm happy to say we have lots of that. Lele Chi League has become very active um, up and down the Treasure Coast. The Stuart Le Leche League has recently um, relaunched with a, a new leader and there are meetup times available. So if you go online to the Le Leche League um, website, you should be able to find those meetups. At Martin, we offer a new mom breastfeeding support group at Tradition Medical Center, which meets every other Friday. There is a lactation nurse available. It's not meant to be a lactation specific consultation, but there is lactation support there. Um, there's a scale for weighing the baby. There's some snacks. Older siblings are welcome to attend. And um, if you live in Stewart, then there's also a, um, a new mom's uh, breastfeeding support group called It Takes a Village. That's meeting at the Blake Library on some occasional Sundays. So if you look into the library system, you should be able to get those dates as well. Excellent. And how would you manage a clogged duck? Oh, clogged ducks, those are painful. Yes, <laughs> those are very painful. Not fun. Yes, continue to breastfeed, um, continue to pump a lot, using warm compresses, um, showering in warm water while using lots of, of hand massage um, and massaging that area if you can feel where that duct is, um, really just trying to get the milk flowing. Um, if, if you can, you know, if you're going to be at home, if you can try not to wear a bra, if you're comfortable with that, allowing your breast to fall naturally and lots of massage, lots of warmth, lots of nursing, because the baby is the best pump. Exactly. I say that all the time, the baby's the best pump. So what are some uh, red flags when, you know, our clogged duct has pro progressed? Anytime you're feeling um, any flu-like symptoms, if you're seeing red streaks in your breast, um, just generally feeling some malaise and not well, I would recommend contacting your OB because um, they are a high risk for mastitis at that point, and you may require an antibiotic which if you are an antibiotic and you have mastitis, yes, you can continue to nurse your baby. <laughs> no need to stop. That's going to make it worse. Yes, excellent. And we have other questions coming in. What about sicknesses, colds? Things like that, you know, when they're very mucousy. Sicknesses and colds, if yeah. the baby's very mucousy? Oh, if you're very mucousy? Yeah. Oh, there's a good chance you're probably, your baby's very mucousy too. <laughs> so, yes, continuing to breastfeed. Because why breast milk is so cool too is that it's almost like you're making your own little vaccine um, constantly. Because whatever illnesses you um, have come in contact with, your body is going to produce those antibodies, which enters into your milk. And then you're passively kind of giving that to your baby to protect them. So oftentimes breastfed babies, if there's sickness going around the house, they'll be the healthiest ones in the house. <laughs> so I always say mom should just wash her hands. And, yes. You know, uh, just be careful with the nasal discharge, the, the mucus. Absolutely. Uh, and good hand washing, but continue to breastfeed. And of course, if a baby, especially under the age of two months, spikes a fever, definitely contact your pediatrician. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, oh, this was another question about um, how do we know if baby's getting enough? And I'm going to assume this is more of an older baby. Okay, so again, we're going to continue counting diapers. Um, once the baby is over six days old, we're looking for six very wet diapers. 
Um, and usually babies who are breastfeeding um, will have lots of poopy because breast milk is a laxative. Um, having said that, it's not unusual for a baby to maybe go only one bowel movement a day um, or two days in between, but lots of output. Um, regular pediatrician follow-up visits monitoring our weight gain. Weight's gonna be a huge indicator. And if your baby is active and they're happy and they're having longer periods of um, quiet alertness and wanting to play and look around, then it's a good chance they're getting what they need. But of course, if you're having any question about that, then you contact your pediatrician, your provider. Oh, okay. This is a this is a huge one, especially for a new mom. Caffeine intake. Can moms drink coffee and breastfeed? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Like anything else. Yeah. How else would you get by? I mean, why how could you breastfeed that caffeine? <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. Anything in moderation is fine. Um, in the first two weeks when the baby is still very little, um, you may see that it, it causes a little bit more alertness in the baby. Uh, I, antidotally, we hear that, but there's no real um, evidence that says that. Typically, caffeine is very safe. If it enters breast milk, it's such small amounts that it's not going to affect the baby. So, yes. <laughs> We've got a couple more questions coming in. Oh, can you talk about breast milk storage? Sure, sure. Um, and storage at home and at work, and how should the milk be stored at work, and how can mom request her employer to create a safe storage. Space. Right. So again, having that really open dialogue with your employer, even you know, prior to being in the situation. So as you're preparing to go back to work, I think that's a really good question. Um, we kind of go by the five 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 rule. So for a healthy term infant that doesn't have any, you know, any other health adversities that was not born prematurely, um, breast milk is good for about five hours at room temperature. So if you're expressing and you are going to be feeding it to your baby, um, you know, within the next couple hours, there's no need to refrigerate. Um, once it does go in the refrigerator, never in a, a door, it's always best to put it in the middle um, back of the refrigerator. Um, good for about five days. And then if it's in a, um, a deep freezer from a, about five to six months. So five, 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 five at um, room temperature, five days in the refrigerator and about five months in the freezer. And what would I use to store the milk to freeze it? There's lots of products out there. Um, any of the bags, the storage um, bags are wonderful. I always recommend storing in small increments. So even if you're thinking your baby's going to need four ounces um, for this feeding tomorrow, um, if we once we take it out of the freezer and it, it comes to room temperature, it's only good for about 24 hours or as long as it has ice crystals in it. Ice crystals, it's still considered frozen. Um, but if it goes beyond that time, we really recommend that it's probably safer to unfortunately toss it. Um, so if we store in smaller increments and we only have to take two ounces out instead of five ounces out, then we have less waste. Um, so any of the storage milk bags that are out there are great. Do you recommend like a, a Ziploc or? I wouldn't use just a Ziploc bag, okay. um, like a traditional Ziploc bag. Mm -hmm. I would get one specifically for breast milk storage. Okay. Yeah. okay. And when will my nipples stop leaking? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so that is very, you know, it runs the gamut, kind of really varies based on mom, um, based on your storage capacity, um, based on um, how you react to hormones. Some moms never leak. Sometimes some moms leak um, the entire time that they're producing milk. It really varies. And no, no one is like more normal than another. It just depends on how you react to it. Um, back to it being so hot and humid in Florida, mm -hmm. if you do tend to leak and you're using any type of uh, um, insert in your bra to catch that milk so that you're not showing through your shirt, um, change those frequently. Because again, if there's any breakdown in the nipple um, and then we've got milk coming into it or sweating into it, we don't want any bacteria potentially to enter into the breast tissue. Okay. And how can mom improve latching? So um, if we get off to the best start, right, trying to avoid any of those artificial nipples, um, avoiding pacifiers in the beginning days of life, trying to be patient and while working on that deep latch is going to get us off to the best start. Um, if we're talking now, we're a couple of days out or a couple of weeks out um, and mom's still having pain, um, you can always come see a lactation consultant. 
Um, just being really patient, trying to wait until the baby opens really, really wide, like a yawn, mm-hmm. and bringing them in quick and close. Should Lots of hurt? skin to skin. No, it should okay. not hurt. Um, and I think that's one of my happiest things to tell mom is that if it's hurting, something's wrong, and we can fix that. Um, so there's no need to rough up your nipples during pregnancy. That's all old school. Throw that out the door. That's a myth we definitely want to bust. Um, it, pain is not something that you have to endure. Um, if the baby's latched on nice and deep and they're transferring milk well, um, there might be a pinch for the first 15 or 30 seconds, but that should feel like a gentle tug following that. If not, do not be afraid to take the baby off um, and work on latching again. And How always skin to skin. Um, there's one of two ways. You can either um, gently apply, apply pressure to the corner of the mouth here mm-hmm. to break that seal, or if your hands are clean, um, use your pinky finger inside their mouth break that seal um, and and take them off the breast so that we're not causing any more nipple pain with that. (laughs) Yes. And are there any foods to avoid while breastfeeding? You know, there's really not any evidence that we need to avoid any foods. Um, Whatever culturally you enjoy, I know there's, you know, the old wives tales would say onions make babies gassy or broccoli or spicy food, but there's really no evidence of that. And whatever you enjoyed is your family foods during pregnancy, your amniotic fluid already tastes like that. So your breast milk will taste like that. Um, so it's kind of cool about breast milk as well is that the flavors are always different and it sets up that baby for food preferences later in life. Um, so as long as it's working well for you, the only thing that uh, potentially could be a concern is um, with dairy, with cow's milk specifically. And it's not an allergy as much as there's a protein in the cow's milk that can cause a sensitivity. Um, So if you're seeing that your baby is excessively gassy, um, they're having really, really like lime green poopies. Um, They're really, really spitty. Maybe they have rashes on their faces or on their bottom. That would be something to talk to your healthcare provider about. Um, That's the only thing I would say then we would maybe trial taking dairy out of mom's diet which is gonna take probably four to six weeks to really clear from her diet before she sees dramatic improvement in the baby. Otherwise, enjoy. (laughs) And linked to that, can mom have alcohol while breastfeeding? That is always a thing. Yeah, that's there's always a lot. I always yes. wait to see who the brave <laughs> one in class is gonna to be to ask that question. Um, just like with caffeine, anything in moderation. What um, the, the literature says is that if you're Sober enough to operate a motor vehicle, you're probably fine to breastfeed. Um, I would say try and plan if you're going to have, you know, a, one glass of wine or a drink with dinner. Um, maybe try not to breastfeed immediately following that, um, but waiting a few hours. Um, I think one thing people always ask about pumping and dumping, right? right? Yeah. So I think where the misconception comes in is that um, moms are afraid that the alcohol, once it enters the breast milk, that it stays in the breast milk. And that's not true. It filters in and out of the breast milk the same way it does your blood. So once it's out of your blood and the blood alcohol level is low enough to Mm -hmm. resume normal activity or operating a motor vehicle, um, then it's it's sufficiently safe to um, breastfeed the baby. Okay. And this one came in about smoking and breastfeeding. Smoking cigarettes or smoking marijuana? <laughs> Do we have any specific? They didn't specify. Okay, we could start with cigarette smoking. So uh, the recommendation is still even if mom does smoke, um, because the benefits outweigh the risks um, that she can continue to to breastfeed her baby. Um, having said that, we want to make sure we're never smoking around the baby. Um, and then additionally, so that's our secondhand smoke. We want to be very cautious of. Um, You also need to think about third-hand smoke, which I don't know if everybody's ever heard of that, but third-hand smoke means even if you're around someone else that's smoking Mm -hmm. and it's clinging to your hair, it's clinging to your clothes, um, you may not realize that, but it's it's quite hard on the baby. Um, So if you're smoking in your clothes and then bringing your baby onto you, that could be really bad for the baby. Right, it also um, increases the risk of cysts, okay. and sudden infant death, pneumonias, ear infections. Exactly. So really not advisable. It, no, I it, I would say if we we can plan on not to, yes. and trying to quit smoking, then let's yeah. find a support group to help with that. Exactly. Um, and this one is, well, we talked a little bit about when to stop breastfeeding, but I think this parent wanted um, an age. Oh. 
Okay. Um, so again, when to stop, as long as you're enjoying it and your baby's enjoying it, there's really not a specific age when you should stop. Um, in our country, we, we shoot for at least a year. Um, and then beyond that is as you feel comfortable, the rest of the world and developing countries are looking more at two to three years. Even beyond that. And even beyond that, yeah. So uh, there's really not a hard stop as to when you should stop. <laughs> Personal choice. Absolutely. And this question is about foods to improve milk production or milk quality. Right. So I think we kind of talked about that with the supplements. Um, there's no uh, evidence that any foods are going to improve milk production um, and quality of the milk. That's an interesting question. Um, you know, uh, whatever you enjoy, um, I think it's more important for mom's health that she's eating um, a really nutritious diet. One, so that she's well enough to care for her child. Um, and two, we know that uh, mom's body will pull from her system to put it in the breast milk. Um, so if she's needing calcium, she's needing whatever it is, it will pull from her system and give to the baby. So in order to really make sure mom is well nourished and healthy, um, then she shouldn't eat a, a balanced diet. Right. So I've had a mom tell me that I can't breastfeed my, my baby or I don't want to breastfeed my baby because I don't eat a healthy diet. I don't have a balanced diet. And so sure. my breast milk may not be that. And that's not true. No, it's still going to be absolutely the best thing for your baby. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. What does Shane do an exercise routine affect breast production or milk production? Say that again. Exercise routines and want to start exercising or decrease it. Will an exercise um, routine decrease breast uh, milk production? Yeah. No, no, absolutely not. Okay. No, no, no concerns. It's good to exercise <laughs> if you can. <laughs> And rest enough to feel well enough to exercise and go for it. And this mom wants to know how can they get in touch with you, Ashley? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I am the, um, the full-time lactation consultant at Martin Health at the North Hospital in Stewart. Um, so I think we're going to post the, the yes. phone number mm -hmm. that you can get a hold of me. Absolutely. Yes. So the contact info will be posted on uh, the Optimal Care Facebook yeah. page. Yeah, so we can put my email address and my office phone number on there, and I would love to... Yeah hear from you if you have more questions or want to come in for a consult. <laughs> and well, going, this one's going back. Uh, they wanted to touch on uh, the marijuana smoking. Oh, okay. So um, that's one of those things we really don't have any evidence on. That, that's <laughs> because it's not been legal for very long in, in most states. Um, I know that's a highly controversial question. Mm -hmm. um, Hmm. I shouldn't have even opened up that own box of worms on myself. <laughs> um, we don't have a lot of evidence. We don't have a lot of evidence. So, the same guidelines that we're using for cigarettes. Not smoking to, around. Exactly. To um, avoid. Um, and certainly if you're under, being under the influence of anything, that's going to change decision making. That might um, change uh, reaction time. Um, we just don't want to do anything to, to put the health of the baby or the safety of the baby at risk. Um, so if you're, again, if the effects of that have gone out of your body, um, it's probably safe, but we just don't have enough information yet. Probably will be to come. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure there'll be yeah. more studies in the future. Yeah. Right. Do we have any other questions coming in right now? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, this has been a wonderful session. Yes, this um, is awesome. Thank you, all of you, for participating, and thank you, Ashley, for coming in. Um, and having Thanks this for conversation having me. with us. Yeah, this is great. And if anybody has any further questions, um, I can be reached at Optimal Care Pediatrics, 772-301-0123, and we are going to post Ashley's uh, contact info as well. All the best, and everybody have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for joining.